successful. All right. We are super excited. It is the mental health moment. Big day today. Huge day today. We've got Steve joining us and Patty joining us from the Morgan Foundation and something for Kelly Foundation. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Good morning. morning. Happy New Year. Thank you. And the same to you. Thank you. So big guest today. I mean, we've got Dr. Ann Amelia with us today. Yes. This is exciting. And we we are just thrilled. Uh, The doctor is the chief medical officer and and chief clinical officer of the Eating Recovery Center, not just here in town or in Texas, but nationwide. Well, and the Insight Behavioral uh, Health as well. And so, super excited. Absolutely. Good morning, doctor. Thank you. I'm real happy to be here. Could you go into your background a little bit and tell us about you and and ERC? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, um... It's always an interesting story how people get into eating disorder treatment. Um, It's not actually a subject or an area of medicine that's taught all that much in med school. But I started off as a psychologist in Kentucky um, about 100 years ago. um, And I decided I wanted to go to med school. So I was a psychologist when I went to med school. And then I went to med school to become a psychiatrist. But along the way, I got pretty interested in pediatrics. And really where my career ended up is I was interested in medically complicated psychiatric patients and psychiatrically complicated medical patients or pediatric patients. And guess where eating disorders live? That's exactly where they live. So, you know, we have so so an interest in both the medical and the psychiatric aspects of this treatment um, of these illnesses are actually pretty important for helping a person all the way to recovery. So I just sort of found my way there. And one of the things about treating eating disorders is once you actually say you're willing and interested in doing it, your your practice fills with eating disorder patients because a lot of people just don't know how to take care of my patients. So that's how I got here. Um, ERC, or Eating Recovery, was started for similar reasons. Uh, about 11 years ago, there were two psychiatrists in Denver, Ken Weiner and Rick Bishop, who saw that patients with eating disorders, especially severe forms of the eating disorders, really weren't being well cared for outside of a specialized care setting. So they started a hospital to start with. They started at the highest levels of care to take care of people with eating disorders, especially people with the most severe form of eating disorders. And then since then, we've built a completely vertically integrated healthcare system where we can take care of patients with the same care team often through all levels of care so we can take care of them when they come in really quite ill from their illness, from their eating disorder, and continue their care until they're really ready to launch back home and into recovery. Doctor, so at this point, about how many doctors and and medical professionals report to you? Report to me? I think we're at about 82 doctors. And that is nation. Why, Nationally, right? yeah. Okay. Correct, yeah. Now, at some point, you also entered into a relationship with Insight Behavioral Health. Can yeah. you go into that a little bit? Sure. That's an interesting story. So, um, so Ken Weiner, one of the founders of Eating Recovery Center, had a, one of his very best friends was a psychologist in Chicago named Susan McClanahan. Now, Susan had built... Um, eating disorder specialized care, but she had built it from the lowest levels of care and was building up the levels of care. So she'd started with outpatient care, and then she'd built um, built up to intensive outpatient treatment and then to partial hospitalization treatment. And really when she was ready to build up into 24-hour care setting, that's when she partnered with Eating Recovery Center, um, and we became fused. Now the the Chicago uh, system actually had peeled off into three um, three arms of treatment. There was eating disorder treatment um, for anorexia and mostly, but in the Chicago system, Susan McClanahan had also built specific treatments um, separate from other eating disorders for binge eating patients. And people in Chicago were so interested in the care that she was providing, the quality of care she was providing for eating disorders, she was consistently being asked to to go ahead and open up that treatment to people without eating disorders with the same model of care. So in Chicago, they were building another arm of treatment um, 
um, through insight behavioral health for mood and anxiety disorders independent of any eating disorder problems. So, so over time, in the five and a half years since Insight Behavioral Health and Eating Recovery Center have joined, Eating Recovery Center has actually now, um, we, we've started to do more and more mood and anxiety disorder treatment too, because the, the treatment that we've been providing for eating disorders, which is hugely family-based, really, really spending a lot of time on educating and involving family and providing the highest quality psychotherapy, um, for people with mood and anxiety disorders is, is, is a product of the, the expertise we've developed around eating disorders. It works for our mood and anxiety disorder patients too. Do, doctor, now you have some very big news about uh, the North Texas air, area and uh, the venture between e, ERC and Inside. Is that correct? Yeah, we will be opening a brand new um, a very large hospital in Plano. So we're going to be expanding our specialized 24-hour eating disorder care um, in order to fill what is really a, a dire gap in services for eating disorders, especially for children and adolescents, and especially for adults with severe forms of the illness the high, requiring high levels of care. We've actually had a uh, inpatient and par uh, residential and partial um, bed, beds and slots available in Plano at the, on the Baylor Hospital campus already, but we have constantly had a waiting list um, for, um, for those beds. In Texas, many people have insurance plans that actually keep them in Texas for all their care, so they're not able to leave the state for, for care, and there's just been a big shortage of, um, of inpatient and residential beds um, for adults and kids with eating disorders. So we'll be expanding this. Um, we have a 100,000 square foot hospital opening up um, within the next couple of weeks. Just as soon as we get our license from the state of Texas, we'll be opening those beds. Doctor, we, we know as well since uh, December 2017, uh, North Te Texas has lost almost a third of its behavioral ha health beds because facil facilities have closed or they just just not financially uh, vi viable for them to stay uh, 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 open. Is that in part why you felt the need? And you're going to be treating more than just eating disorders at your new place. Can you go into you know the type of treatments and illnesses that you're going to address there? Absolutely. So you're, you're exactly right. We have been losing beds um, for mental health concerns in North Texas, um, and we are, we'll be opening these beds in direct response to that. We will be opening not only eating disorder specialized beds at an inpatient and res residential level of care, but we will be opening mood and anxiety beds as well. Um, and this will be for children and, and adolescents and also for adults, obviously on separate units. But it, it is because these beds have been closing, and we want to, and, and it's really crucial that people have access to residential beds for treating um, significant major depressive disorder, um, debilitating anxiety disorders, OCD, and trauma related illnesses. Doctor, in addition to these other issues that you're talking about, I know that you have discussed the high rate of comorbidity. Will you talk a minute about um, addiction, alcohol, substance abuse, and how you'll be able to help people that struggle with those subjects as well? Sure. For people who are suffering from depressive disorders or anxiety disorders, and also for our patients with eating disorders, it's, it's, it's about half of our patients also suffer from some significant problems with substance use disorders. So we provide um, specialized programming along with specialized eating disorder or specialized mood and anxiety treatment um, for those patients. Because so many of our problems, but I, I think of a sort of a whack-a-mole approach, just as you start to get, say, an eating disorder well under control, um, you're not engaging in the eating disorder behaviors, but what will pop up? Pop up a new, you know, a different uh, difficult coping strategy, um, substance use disorder or sometimes other, you know, symptoms of a mood disorder. So so you, you get one problem kind of settled and up pops a different one. And so we you have to treat patients in a setting that can actually manage the new behaviors or the new symptoms or the recurring symptoms as they pop up, just as you get one 
um, set of symptoms settled down. That kind of brings us into the next subject about how you can take care of these folks. It, we discussed the other day about chronic versus acute, and this mm -hmm. whack-a-mole approach that you're discussing kind of lends to the issue that this is not necessarily effective or successful if you just treat this in an acute manner. Would you talk a little bit about that? I absolutely agree with you. This is actually the, the basis of uh, our model of care, where we try to, to keep a patient with their same care providers through all levels of care, for, or at least for as many levels of care as possible. So inpatient stabilization, you know, our focus is on acute symptoms and safety. If it's an eating disorder, we're focused on nutritional stabilization, getting heart rate and medical symptoms stabilized. At a residential level of care, we really start to involve family. We start to involve people's real life supports and their real life stresses. And they learn skills for managing the symptoms, especially as they start to change from one set of symptoms to another set of symptoms. And then we move people out into an outpatient setting, into a partial hospitalization setting where they still actually have quite a lot of support. We have lengthy 10-hour partial hospitalization programming with, so there's still quite a lot of support as we're moving people out into the world. And then we move people as close to home as possible. So people have sustainable recovery when they're in their real lives. And so the longer we can keep people in, in care with this with the consistency of, of, of treatment approach and as, as much as possible with the same providers so they don't have to be retelling their story and, and, and getting new relationships at each level of care, the more likely they are to recover because of this smooth transition. Um, and then we try to move them home and help them sustain that recovery. So, Doctor, you were, you were talking about how important the family is, and I think that that's critical that we have a minute to discuss that as well. Perhaps when we get back, yeah. we can talk about the family. You know, something else sure. I want to talk about uh, as well, Doctor, is the fact that there isn't a lot of help or, or survival skills being taught. I'm going to use the word survival skills in the rural communities. Is there mm -hmm. a push to go towards a, a two-way conference support system like a lot of the hospitals and healthcare facilities have gone to for medical issues in regards to like heart or colds or flus or because they don't have access to hospitals as well. So when we come back, we'd like to discuss that for just a few moments as well. We are JP, Kathy, and the crew. We have the Something for Kelly Foundation and Morgan Foundation in today on the Mental Health Moment. We'll be right back after these messages. Can you turn her? Can you there turn you. Patty's microphone up? She sounds really, really low. She sounds really low. D D pa Patty, we keep talking. You have talk. Is that better? Uh, yeah, not so much. Hold on. Don't adjust your neck. Let me adjust that bad boy. Okay. Oh, let, okay. Talk, let talk, her talk Patty. Her is that any better? Any different? That's better. better. What do you think, Christy? Maybe turn up the baby a bit more. Uh, All right. Okay, Doctor. Let's let, let's talk a little bit about you. Know, we, we've got about a four minute break here. Yeah. But you're sure. still on Facebook. Facebook can still hear you. Absolutely. Oh, great. Hey, Facebook. <laughs> Hello. Um, they say hi back. <laughs> Doctor, wave your hand into the phone. <laughs> we, we spoke a little bit about the role that, that particularly dads uh, play. Can you go into that and just how important it is that, you know, moms and dads have a role in the recovery of a person who's suffering from uh, eating disorders and other mental illnesses? Yes, when a kid or a young adult or even even older adults um, are in treatment, we spend hours every week with family involvement and educating parents about uh, and, 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 and other support people around what it, it exactly is happening to their loved one. So our doctors and our, our therapists um, have um, spent time educating fathers in particular. So we have good studies that show a father's in, involvement improves the chances of successful recovery. Dads need to actually have a particular approach to I think I think uh, Dr. Tyler Wooten is actually our father expert within our system. And he will go in and he will talk to a father like, you know, just like a, 
a, a male doctor can talk to a doctor and he will talk to them about being pig-headed and trying to rush to solutions and they just need to do what he says <laughs> and he'll say i will tell you how to get your kid better but you have to do what i say and it works <laughs> you know when they start listening they um they can they can really understand um, with with support what's happening to their kids and their their wives um, and they can help get them better of course you know first man we're we're pro we're programmed to fix things so mm -hmm. how tough is it to to you you almost have to reprogram a man's brain that this is something that you <laughs> can't fix and you know now we we may have simple brains for the most part so it shouldn't <laughs> be that, that that tough but uh, you know if you would go into some of the unique cha cha well, challenges well, you face. Yeah, so, so part of it is is when you're treating an eating disorder, it actually looks quite simple to fix, right? Um, how many dads in particular said, just eat your food, and they try to sit their kid down and they just say, you will not get up until you eat this food. And until you tr understand that, yes, the answer is simple, but it is extraordinarily difficult, right? So just, it's not complicated, but it's hard. And so helping dads in particular really understand the battle that is going inside the head of a person with an eating disorder, that it is a, a, an all-out war inside that head. Mm -hmm. They can then come from a place of coaching and, you know, emotion coaching and behavior coaching instead of sort of the rhinoceros approach where you will do what I say. So we've got about 15 seconds before we go back on air. When, when we come back, we do want to address the outreach to people in non-urban places, in, in the rural communities, and what's being done to help them, as well as just giving some advice to people who are struggling with this d disease, of course. Great. Because, you know, 10 seconds. Good morning. Welcome back to 1160 AM KBDT News Talk Sports. It is currently 854 here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Let's go over to the weather station with Kathy. Well, I don't know how far you have to travel to that weather station. Stop it. Stop <laughs> the weather it. station. <laughs> oh. I'm sitting right next to you in studio. We're at a high of 62, 69 today, low of 62, currently 61. I'm going to give you a fresh one right here on the air. Goodness gracious. Oh, don't forget, coming up at 9 o'clock this morning, Chosen Generation Radio with Pastor Greg. And then this afternoon, don't forget to pick up the Wells Report with John David Wells from 2 to 5 p.m. Right here on 1160 AM KBDT News Talk Sports. All right, we have the mental health moment and uh, very excited. And I'd asked you this earlier, and if – what do we do with the folks in the rural areas? They they can't yeah. find services. They can't find support. They have to run into the cities. They they don't get the necessary longevity of the support that they need. So a lot of recidivism within the mm -hmm. realm of eating disorders, mental health stability. Is there a look in the industry to go towards the video, two-way video support that a lot of the hospitals and healthcare systems are going to? Yes. So, so I want you to think of our care system in Texas as sort of uh, spokes of a wheel. So we have bedded sites. Um, so we it, we have inpatient and residential sites in Plano, Dallas area, and then we have partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient levels of care available in uh, let's see, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, the Woodlands. But and so Pex patients from all over Texas can step up or step down through these levels of care as needed, ensuring consistency of treatment, as we were discussing. But we do also have a virtual intensive outpatient program. So that's still nine hours of specialized care um, in a group setting. So there'd be six patients, you know, in their own homes or in another site where they're joining into group sessions um, via video sessions. So that's available to residents who are unable to commute to treatment centers regularly. 
Uh, it's a really wonderful program. We have results that show that it is just as effective as live inpatient intensive outpatient programming. We have had some trouble getting insurance funding for the virtual IOP program, but we have the program up, running, ready to go. Um, and we talk to insurance companies about the benefits of this, you know, every single week. Because as you are, are highlighting nicely here, there are patients who just can't get in to cities for the care they need. And there is no specialized mental health care, especially eating disorder care available to them in their own community. So, Doctor, before we head off for the day, let's talk a little bit about access this is an interesting topic. I'm not as familiar with your virtual um, connection. So how do people get access to the Eating Recovery Center, whether they're in the city or whether they are distant? There's actually one central phone number that people can call just for information or for a free confidential assessment done by a master's level provider. So on our website, the number is there. But see if I remember the phone number, it's 877-825-8584. So that's a, um, a, you can call for information about eating disorders or an assessment about what your um, you or a loved one's particular needs are. Um, and you, you would have a full assessment done on the phone and a recommendation for all of the, um, all of the care um, that we have available would be made by that master's level um, clinician on the phone to tell you what would be available nearby or if based on the information provided you need higher levels of care, or if outpatient resources, just hooking, just connecting you with a community or with the virtual IOP program. And what is your website, if they want to catch you that way? Mm, I, you know what? I would just Google eating recovery. <laughs> <but I think laughs> Sorry about that, sounds doctor. sounds like that's the easiest way. <laughs> Stop the doctor. I, and I think it's eatingrecovery.com. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Open around, Steve. You're, you're a good man. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that was going to be a hardball for you, Doctor. <laughs> Dr. Zoe, do you have any last words of advice for people who are struggling with eating disorders or any other type of mental health issues at this point? What, Absolutely. what advice would I mean, you give? The, the main thing to know is that help is available and it is important to allow yourself to accept help. So often people are struggling with a routine or a set of rules that have become familiar um, and, and they develop comfort and even a sense of safety by following rules that are actually quite dangerous. So they're dangerous both medically, developmentally, and socially. Um, the same is true for a significant mood or anxiety disorder. The, you know, the discomfort associated with seeking help can sometimes feel overwhelming, but it's uncomfortable and it's really hard to change these behaviors and change our thinking, but it is absolutely worth it. Well, I'll tell you what, um, cannot thank you enough for all that you have been a part of and what you guys are doing here in North Texas. God bless you. Stay with us, uh, Doc. Don't leave us because we're going to continue on Facebook to answer some questions and there's some comments. We are JP, Kathy, and the crew. We're signing off. Have a blessed day. All right, so we're gonna we're on Facebook did we now. Go, did we go out without music? Yeah, oh, we did. Okay. Oh no, okay, got gotcha. you. No, no big deal. We're, we're still survive. on, Doctor. We're still on Facebook, so let's get some more plugs in for help. Well, um, before we go any further, Steve and Patty, I want to make I want to read some of the comments from our Facebook page. We have we have a lot of interaction, um, Doctor, and, and so I want to make sure that so some of this says prevention should start with infants. People who overfeed babies all the time, so they sleep continuously, then continue to parent with food and tablets. Uh, here, eat more, playing on your tablet. I'm busy. These same parents act surprised. These kids become morbidly overweight. Um, I feel like really wealthy children and low-income kids suffer the most from eating disorders because they are more likely to be neglected by their parents on an emotional level. Any response to all of that? Yeah. I mean, I can say that. Uh, so I, I absolutely agree that we should be screening and educating around eating disorders and healthy um, balance of food and uh, and exercise um, right from the get go. I think that as we're we're helping parents understand how to feed their kids and how to respond to their kids' emotional needs, nutritional needs, um, exercise needs, we should be helping parents uh, make decisions based not so much on what their kid is going to look like, but helping their kid understand the 
the need to make choices and to develop eating and movement habits that are really based on being healthy, strong, powerful, rather than being built on um, um, feeling attractive or, or in our culture so often, um, food and appearance is associated with a sense of self-discipline, which we really, you know, value quite a bit. So we want to be screening in pediatric settings. Um, we want to be screening in diabetes clinics, and we want to be helping people understand how to make choices about food and movement and our size related to being strong, powerful, healthy, and you know what it what is uniquely ourselves, rather than really um, contributing to this drive for thinness that becomes quite over idealized and is actually not achievable for many people. So when people are constantly chasing an ideal that is not realistic, then they get discouraged and they end up throwing the whole plan out instead of just learning to eat what their body really needs and, you know, and exercise and move in a way that is, makes them feel um, empowered. Doctor, in addition to some of the issues that you just discussed about the, the eating and the nutrition, there's the aspect of emotional eating where we seek mm -hmm. comfort foods and then there's the issue yeah. all around the cultural habits of different groups of people where they have celebrations and, and fastings and very food related. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. And what, what kind of progress is being made in those arenas as you educate and screen? Yeah, I think that we want everyone to actually ask themselves. The world the world is divided into emotional restrictors and emotional eaters, right? Um, so some people actually find it much harder to eat when they're under stress, and those are the people who would be at risk for a restrictive type eating disorder. They do feel less anxious um, when they're not eating. And then the world is, and then there are other people who are the emotional eaters where they're, they're not consciously deciding, you know, this is what I'm hungry for, this is what I'd like to eat, but it becomes a, a uh, a coping strategy or a stress-related behavior. So helping people draw attention, first of all, you know, am I an emotional eater or an emotional restrictor? Because both can actually cause problems. And in each case, we actually want to learn alternative strategies for managing our stress and, and well-being. Dr. We also, in the past few years, we have come to know so much about the genetic and brain aspects mm -hmm. of this disease. Is that something you you also try to educate the moms and dads about when they come in for the first time with their kid and they're you know confused and don't know where to go? Yeah. So we do. We we teach about the heritability of eating disorders. They're they're they are one of the most heritable mental illnesses. So probably about seventy five ish percent of the risk of developing anorexia is related to just your genetic makeup. You know, you were born with that risk, and then, you know, there were whatever other influences um, existed, that gene gets turned on. So, just to compare it, you know, we all know that, you know, breast cancer is a highly heritable illness, right, or problem. And I have a strong family history of breast cancer, so I, I can't walk into my primary care office um, without her wanting to know, you know, what is my breast cancer screening? What have I done? Am I up to date? Um, but the heritability risk for breast cancer is 27%. So 27% of my risk of developing breast cancer is related to my gen genetic risk, whereas for anorexia, it's more like 75%. So, so we should be screening, again, in pediatrics clinics, you know, is there a family history of an eating disorder? And we should be looking out for those kids who are the emotional restrictors, who, you know, just lose those first couple of pounds because if we can catch these illnesses early, they are so much more treatable. Early intervention for eating disorders and, and for mood and for anxiety disorders makes all the difference in the world in a still developing brain. Very good. Well, guys, do you have anything else? No, and I, I mean, I really think you hit a home run on answering the question in regards to pediatrics and what parents are doing and and the fact mm -hmm. that discipline is not related to weight um it's mm -hmm. interesting you said that when i was working a poll out at aldridge elementary school in, in an area here in town um i had a man channel four was out doing an interview um i was elected when i was 18 as a senior in high school and i was running for mm -hmm. re-election i was i think i was in my third term 
running for re-election and channel four was out covering it because they're you know kind of catching up on hey the 18 year old phenom now what's he doing and he's running for re-election and they went up and they asked this man they said so sir you're going to the polls will you be voting for judge payton today and he goes absolutely not look how fat he is clearly he doesn't work hard enough yeah i yeah. mean yeah, yeah on tv it's wow. like dude where'd your teeth yeah. go <laughs> wow. yeah so, i mean the, and, the level of judgment and you know the 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 cultural you know dismissive nature of people who you know are of different sizes is, is sometimes quite astounding well <laughs> what the, what the humor on that is is that my schedule in one day is what most people's schedule is in 30 days. Can you, people can't keep up with me. And I can attest to that. Um, I've got, so it's like right now, I do, I do radio, I do Morgan Foundation, I started a consulting firm, and mm -hmm. I take care of my dad all, mm -hmm. all in one day. And, mm -hmm. and then I do, I do other things as well, which is kind of crazy. But, and I'm starting to write comedy yeah. on top of it <laughs> with all of what I've experienced. He's the person pushing well, for two more hours in the 24 hour day. <laughs> yeah and so it's interesting because it doesn't and i will tell people this i had a a woman tell me once um not too long ago in fact well you know i imagine you can't climb up and, and do some hiking in some of the foothills in phoenix and i said why well you know mm. you, you know and i'm like well you know what <laughs> well you JP, know jp makes them say it i do i've well, been around him <laughs> you know, you, you know your, your size and i said I said, let me tell you something. I said, if I'm not self-aware enough to know that I'm fat, then there's something wrong with me. And mm -hmm. if I want something to be different, then I'll change it because I know mm -hmm. how to change it. And so evidently, I must be okay with who I am and where I'm at, right? And I mm -hmm. said, if I want to go hiking, I may not be as fast as you. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the tortoise, if I'm not mistaken, that lost the race <laughs> with the rabbit. <laughs> Well, and here's so, the thing, you can drop 200 pounds, and guess what? Yeah. Your knees are still going to hurt, honey. You ruined those in high school football. And wrestling. <laughs> I hate right. to tell you. <laughs> those, right. those injuries don't go away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but I, I just I think that it's important uh, that as the hey. messaging gets out there, that size doesn't equal personality. Health. Well, and yeah. it doesn't equal health either. Right. Yeah, because and, and, you know, you know, yeah, I killed my bailiff. My bailiff couldn't believe it. He was diabetic, high blood pressure, horrible cholesterol. My sugar, 90. Blood pressure, 127 mm -hmm. over 72. Cholesterol, mm -hmm. too low because I didn't exercise enough. It's like, John, you mm -hmm. got to exercise. Your cholesterol's super low. And mm -hmm. so, you know, mm -hmm. wait, and I, you got joggers that are in great health. Well, for a jog at 50 years old, they die of a heart attack. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. yeah. So there's not a there's not a perfect correlation at all between size and health, and there certainly isn't be between size and happiness. Right? Amen. So lose two hundred pounds, it does not mean you're going to be happier. And you know, there's not. I mean, there may be some health outcomes that change to some degree, but it's not guaranteed. And there are perfectly healthy healthy people walk, walking around with a BMI over thirty. Absolutely. Well, and my father did a comedy skit. When my mom passed away, he dived into comedy and took comedy classes and wrote comedy. And he had T-shirts made. And his comedy mm -hmm. skit is titled, oh, yeah. are you ready for this? Fat oh, people dear. make better lovers. <laughs> 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 and they, the crowd didn't stop laughing the entire 15-minute set. I mean, it was hilarious. And that is so, really nice to hear. Yeah. yeah. So good stuff. Yeah. Okay, John, I've got two yeah. last things. Next week. On the mental health m moment, we're going to have Don Blackwell. Don has put together this Legacy of Hope Summit that takes place in town oh, yeah, yeah, next yeah. W weekend. Over 20 of the pr most preeminent eating disorder and mental health uh, professionals are coming in town to sit down and brainstorm about ways we can bring the community and industry together. And finally, uh, this upcoming Thursday, uh, ERC does have its open house at its new facility. So, Doctor, we will see you there. Martinis will be on you and Dr. Wu and then <laughs> Stephanie to, afterwards, Does J.P., Kathy, and the crew get to come yeah, from come along. It's, a, it's a party. I love it. <laughs> to see their 100,000 square foot You had facility. me at Martinis. <laughs> Doctor, thank you so much for your time and, and input. We are going to try to get this up. I'm going to try to get my son to have uh, this cut and split and this segment to you by today so you can use it however you want, of course.
course. Mark. Well, thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed it. You bet. Thank you thank so you. much, doctor. Thanks, doc. See you on Thursday. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. That was good stuff. She had a lot of information. Uh, yeah, we could do several shows with her. She had. Yes. I had so many questions, but I know y'all needed to get through your list. But I had all these follow up questions. We could totally do another show with her. All right, Facebook. Have a beautiful, oh, yeah, wonderful, have a amazing day. day. Yeah. And we're going to the weather station with Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> I like the weather station. I'm right next to you. Here I am. I'm not in a weather station. The weather station There's... is to my right. No. The traffic department is to your left. So people who are so Imagine. people who are on Facebook are we're trying to make it like we're in some big old studio. Like we have people running in going, hey, and the weather is. Hey, embrace it. Hey, the Ooh. traffic is. Embrace. <laughs> One last thing. Speaking of walls, somebody when we were in Cabo bought a t-shirt down there. <laughs> it wasn't me, but this t-shirt oh, no. says. Is it appropriate for Facebook? It is. Okay. It's, it's, it's fun. It says, keep calm. You're on the fun side of Trump's wall. Oh, that's funny. With that, oh, no. It is just oh, hilarious. Oh. Oh, you That's should have posted fun. that on Facebook. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, guys, we got to see humpback whales there. I saw those dolphins. Oh, oh, that little video of those baby turtles. Oh, oh my. God. Yeah, just amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. Baby turtles. Well, guys, as always, we don't take.